Good day, everybody. It's uh, exactly noon here at Eastern Time at Michigan, and uh, we are ready to start with our seminar series. We have two speakers uh, today, um, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Quintanar and um, uh, Dr. Diaz. Uh, and uh, just as usual, I will remind you that every speaker has roughly half an hour um, for their presentations, which will be followed by about 10 minutes of uh, uh, Q&A session. And uh, at the end, um, if you have, uh, if you're still interested, uh, the both speakers will stay to answer uh, questions to uh, their presentations. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Liliana uh, Quintanar, um, uh, he, who is the first speaker for today. Uh, she's a professor at the Center for Research and Advanced Studies of the National Polytechnic Institute, uh, Sin, uh, Sin Vestaf, uh, Mexico City. Uh, Dr. Quintanar obtained her PhD at Stanford University working on metalloproteins in Professor Solomon's lab. Then uh, Dr. Quintana returned to Mexico and did her postdoctoral studies on manganese neurotoxicity in the Department of uh, Neurochemistry of the Institute for Cell uh, Physiology at uh, UNAM. In uh, 2005, Dr. Quintana joined the Department of Chemistry at the Center of Research and Advanced uh, Studies. Um, Dr. Quintana received many uh, honors, including the Fulbright Scholarship, the Mexican Academy of Sciences Research a Prize for Young Scientists, and uh, a L'Oreal UNESCO Award for Women in Science. Uh, she has uh, also organized several international workshops and conferences in Mexico and actively promotes academic exchange from between Mexico, the US, and Latin America. Her research uh, focuses on the inter influence of metals on protein aggregation and misfolding and it's uh, and the implications of uh, uh, these um, processes in new neurodegenerative and type 2 diabetes and cataract diseases. I don't want to keep you uh, away uh, and take much of your time. Uh, welcome to our series. Thank you. Thank you very much, Magda. Also, thanks to Rams uh, for the invitation and also for Jin Hui Lu, who's here in the panelists, who suggested my name for this uh, for this uh, great talks. I think it's uh, one of the things we've learned of the pandemics is we lower now the activation barrier to get together through this online platform. So it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you and tell you a little bit of the work we've done in the last years in my group. And as Magda mentioned, I work at this uh, federal research center called Simvestaf. We are a federal research center in Mexico that um, our main mission is research and graduate, offer graduate programs in different areas of science and technology. We have campuses in different uh, states of the country, as you can see in this little map. And um, I've been for the past 17 years at the Department of Chemistry, which is in the main and oldest campus in Mexico City. But also I just recently uh, moved and joined also the Center for Research in Aging. That's uh, part of Simba staff. And uh, it's also in Mexico City, but in a, in a different campus. Um, so my talk is about metal ions and protein aggregation. Uh, and I don't want to miss the opportunity to make sure that we are all on the same page regarding metal ions, because um, these are essential for life. You know, I'm talking about copper, zinc, iron, manganese, that are cofactors of metalloenzymes that catalyze some of the most important redox reactions that sustain life on Earth as we know it. And just to cite an example, everybody knows about cytochrome C oxidase as part of the respiration process. And it's an enzyme that requires many metal ions and mainly copper and iron to activate the molecule of oxygen and reduce it to water. So our body needs these metal ions and there's a very intricate um, network of proteins that are Required to transport these chopper, these um, these metal ions in our body, and make sure it reaches the right place at the right time. 
Uh, however, these same metal ions that are essential for life have been implicated in protein aggregation processes and uh, degenerative diseases. So uh, I'm citing just here some examples in this slide, the prion protein, the beta amyloid peptide, well known for Alzheimer's disease, the alpha synuclein, that's uh, also known as the Parkinson protein, amylin and IAPP, or IAPP that it uh, aggregates from this amyloid aggregates in diabetes type 2, and the crystallines that are proteins in our lens that cause you know, this aggregation that is associated to cataract disease. So what all these proteins have in common really is that they, of course, as we know, they all change their physiologically normal conformation to one that allows them to form the aggregates associated to, to disease. Uh, but also all of them have uh, metal binding sites. Um, and particularly for copper, this is the case. And uh, we don't know, you know, what is the physiological role of this uh, metal binding, uh, but we know that these metal ions are implicated too in the in the aggregation process. So, with this uh, in this context, the three main questions that we ask in my lab is how do these metal ions interact with these proteins? What's the impact of metal ion binding in the folding of the protein and the and the aggregation? And uh, last but not least, because we, we focus a lot on copper and it's a redox active metal ion, we ask the question of what are these redox properties of these metal protein complexes. Of course, we want to ultimately understand what is the role of these metal ions in protein aggregation, redox activity and cell death, and what's the implication in the disease to get uh, some uh, insight to uh, later on the design molecules with therapeutic potential for these diseases. Um, so as I mentioned, all these proteins have or display some sort of copper binding site. Now I'm just going to talk about copper. And the interesting thing is also that all of them are either intrinsically disordered proteins or have regions that are intrinsically disordered. And it's in these regions of intrinsically disorder that the, it, these metal binding sites occur. And this is the case for the, for, for the prion protein and the beta amyloid peptide, which I'm gonna talk about today. And uh, of course, we would like to know what is the impact of the metal ion in this folding and the capacity of the peptide or the protein to aggregate. And then um, in contrast, the only difference here in this table is the crystallines that are, are very, stable and very well um, folded proteins. So they have a very nice structure, yet on the, in disease state, they form these non-amyloid aggregates. And there we will also ask, what is the role of metal ions in this process? So I will tell you two quick stories. One of them has to do, as I mentioned, with the beta amyloid peptide and the prion protein. It does not have a protein aggregation component, but really more thinking about what is the physiological role of their copper binding capabilities and whether there could be a wrestling match for the metal ion at the synapse. And then we'll move on to aggregation, non-amyloid aggregation in this case, of the, of the crystalline proteins in the human lens. So I said metal ions are important because they're cofactors of enzymes like cytochrome C oxidase and you know they're they're sitting there ready to do their redox chemistry. However, in the brain, metal ions can also be signaling agents. And we know very well the case of zinc that is released from synaptic vesicles into the, into the synapse along with glutamate. And then this activates several neuroreceptors in the postsynaptic neuron. And that in turn, starts signal cascades. For example, NMDA receptors let calcium in, and then this um, causes uh, copper to be uh, loaded eventually into these vesicles, and then copper to be excreted, where again, copper can interact with many of these neuroreceptors and modulate their activity. So metal ions in the brain, I just wanna give you the idea that metal ions in the brain can also be very dynamic and they can be um, really acting as signaling agents and, and cell, yes, cell signaling agents. So one of the, these interactions that we're really interested in is uh, or almost a decade ago, it was reported that the prion protein that is, uh, you know, in the, in the extracellular 
part of neurons and it's right there at the synapse, um, the prion protein and copper ions were uh, needed for these neuroprotective mechanisms. So I mentioned before here that calcium goes in through these uh, neuroreceptors. And um, if, too, if this channel remains open and too much calcium goes in, then we get excitotoxicity, we get neurotoxicity. But we, we require the prion and the copper ion there to modulate and close this channel and so modulate this activity of the NMDA receptor such that you know, we have this neuroprotective mechanism. They also reported back then that the amyloid peptide could be disrupting this interaction. And the hypothesis is that it could take away all the copper from the prion protein and then cause it would be a way in which this um, peptide will be causing early neurotoxicity. And just to remind you, these receptors are very important for memory processes to, to you know, establish synapses that are important for memory. So we ask the question whether the beta amyloid peptide and the prion protein could be competing for copper here at the synapse. We could, could there really be a competition between those, these two copper binding proteins? And probably I don't need to say much about the prion protein to this community. We all know it as you know, the, this um, a protein which has this isoform that is the scrappy form that is the infectious agent but rich in beta sheet folding and the responsible for these TSEs, for transmission of TSEs. So as I said, it's anchored to the membrane and uh, it has a nicely C-terminal structure region, but it also has this unstructured and terminal domain. And this is what I was talking about in this intrinsically disordered region of the prion protein is where we have these copper binding sites. So um, there's many functions that have been proposed and I'll show you later a diagram where you, know, you can appreciate the many different protein-protein interactions in which the prion protein can engage as part of probably its normal uh, physiological function. Um, so we and other groups have studied copper binding to the prion protein and now we have a pretty good picture of how it looks. There's this octa-repeat region that it's basically four repeats where we have four histidines that bind copper in this fashion as reported by Milhauser some years back. And um, also depending on how much copper to protein ratio we have, it could have a high occupancy mode like this, or you can have a copper binding several histidines like this. Um, we also know there's two more binding sites that are not the octa repeat sites that also bind copper and they have some pH equilibrium at, at physiological pH. So there's many different species of copper bound to the prion that can be formed. Also half of the prion protein in our brain is cleaved in this way by the alpha, is suffering this alpha cleaved. And the cleft occurs right here in the last binding site in histidine 111. And we end up with a completely different coordination chemistry for copper here. So just to summarize, uh, the, the way it will look is the prion protein is here in the membrane, you know, the lip, these lipid wraps. And um, depending on how much copper there is, it could ad adopt different conformations and it could have different extents of copper loading. And if it's cleaved, it could uh, be binding the one-to-one -one or two-to-one from the coordination chemistry we know. Um, and so now we we want to ask the questions of these each of these binding sites. How do they compete with the beta amyloid peptide? And the beta amyloid peptide you probably also really know well. It's a forty two residue peptide that um, has this hydrophilic region where it has histidines and uh, these um, aspartate that are the anchoring sites for copper, and it has this hydrophobic domain where you know, that's the cause of the amyloid aggregation of the prompt, you know, this hydrophobic region. Uh, we know also that there's two different binding modes for copper with the amyloid beta peptide at a physiological pH. And we also know the redox activity, but I won't go into that. We also know that copper changes completely the amyloid aggregation pathway, uh, leading to the formation of large oligomers. This is work we've done, we've done some years back. Um, and many other groups have really studied the impact of metal ions on the aggregation of this peptide. Here we just want to look for the competition. So as I said, 
um, uh, we look for how the amyloid beta peptide can it really take away the copper from the different binding sites of the prion protein. And this was work done by my grad student, Anai Posadas, who, who just graduated actually um, this year. So um, I'll go really quick. I'm not going to stop through the spectroscopy with the EPR and circular dichroism to look at the copper binding to these proteins, but I'll just go really quickly to tell you the summary. The amyloid beta peptide really struggles to take away the copper from the low occupancy mode. So when there's little copper, A beta has a hard time to take away the copper. When it's high occupancy, when there's lots of copper, the A beta can easily take it out, but somewhere in the middle forms a ternary complex that looks like, oh, sorry, that looks like this, um, you know, bridging the metal ion between the two proteins. And uh, the non opta repeat sites are really easy. The, those are the lowest affinity, so it's not surprising the A beta can take away the copper from them. And then um, from the alpha clips, which is half of the pre and protein in our brain, amyloid beta cannot really take away the copper. It ends up forming a ternary complex that we think looks more or less like this copper bridging between the two amino groups and the two histidines of these two proteins. So the main message I want to give here is the capability of the prion protein and the amyloid beta to form through copper ions, you know, a ternary complex. And this is important because then the picture here for a beta neurotoxicity um, with respect to the activity of NMDA receptors is not as simple as it, we thought initially. It's not like it can just take away the copper from all the binding sites. In some of the sites, it can form these ternary complexes that will definitely disrupt whatever interaction there is between the prion protein, the copper, and the NMDA receptors in this neuroprotective mechanism. And I want to draw your attention to, to these because um, the prion protein, as I said, it engages in interacting with many different proteins at the synapse. It's important for the formation of extracellular matrix uh, uh, complexes. It's important in neurotogenesis and plasticity. It's also important in cell migration. And in all these functions, the prion protein interacts with many proteins. And many times the area of interaction, it's actually this intrinsically disordered region where we find the copper binding sites. So uh, this is important to keep in mind because I really put the question out there. We just put it out in this opinion article, like how many of these protein-protein interactions that the prion is engaged with may be involving copper ions, because that's the region where it binds copper. And in terms for uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, as you probably know, there's a lot of um, a lot of efforts on you know, developing small molecules that could target A beta aggregation and also chelate the metal ions like copper and zinc that can induce also the aggregation. But we, we send here a big warning that we really need to take care of or you know, take care of the functional prion uh, copper interaction, the functional copper protein interactions that could be happening at the synapse. So it won't, it won't be as easy as just chelating the metal ions out because there's really a physiological role of copper binding there. In this case today, I show you binding to the prion protein and being important with these neuroprotective mechanisms. So with this, I, oh, oh, sorry, yes, and of course I forgot. So so back, in, since this is aggregation <laughs> um, uh, webinar, I forgot, uh, the, this is what I was talking about. Like a lot of people are trying to um, develop by functional molecules that will have some component that will modulate the A beta aggregation and some component that will chelate the copper. And back then we did a bit of work with this peptide, but many other groups have done a lot of a lot of development of these bifunctional molecules. And so we just want to send the message that we should keep in mind not to disturb the functional copper protein interactions at the synapse. And um, and this is some, some work that my student Victor Lopez Guerrero is, is right now doing, thinking about all these different interactions, copper protein interactions at the synapse. So I will quickly move on to my second story, 
um, that has to do with the with these crystalline proteins in the human lens. And uh, this is really interesting because the human lens, it's a very special place in our body. It's composed of uh, fiber cells that are um, arranged in this way. Um, these cells differentiated during the embryonic stage and they um, are voided of any organelles. So they don't have any nuclei, any mitochondria. They don't have production of new proteins and they don't have a repair or degradation of, of damaged proteins. So really the proteins that end up in these fiber cells have to be very soluble and very stable to assure the transparency of the lens, but also because the crystallines you have right now in your human lens it's all the crystallines you've got for the rest of your life. They were synthesized when, when you were an embryo and, uh, and uh, there's no more. That's all you've got because uh, these, these cells cannot produce more. So let me tell you a bit about these proteins. So these alpha crystallines that are multimeric and they act as chaperones and the beta gamma crystallines. The beta crystallines form these stable dimers and these gamma crystallines that are very similar in folding, but these are monomeric. And these, um, I'll tell you about gamma D, C, and S. So these are three gamma crystallines that are among the more abundant ones in the, in the human lens. And these proteins are really stable. They're among the most stable we have in our body. But if they suffer throughout the lifetime, oxidative damage, truncation, deamidation, UV damage, you know, they could form these partially folded intermediates that are prone to aggregation, non-amyloid aggregation mostly. So um, the kind of damage that could be happening is um, if, you, if you are exposed to UV light, so uh, Rams was saying he wants to come to Cancun. So Rams, if you come to Cancun in Mexico, make sure you wear sunglasses because if you are sipping your margarita in Cancun, nice Cancun, Caribbean beach, um, and you're not wearing sunglasses, these uh, tryptophans could, in the crystallines and gamma crystallines could be suffering this type of uh, damage. So they will form kynurenine. So this is a more a polar moiety than this indole ring in the, in the tryptophan. So uh, this more polar moiety, because these tryptophans are in a hydrophobic core, then you know they will cause unfolding of the protein and then you have aggregation. Now, if Rams goes to Cancun and takes this margarita under the sunshine and doesn't wear sunglasses, he doesn't come back to Michigan and finds he has cataract disease. Of course not, because while he was doing that, he had the alpha crystalline uh, in his lens that can identify these partially folded intermediates and form these soluble complexes. So they keep them out of trouble. But we are in a very low metabolism environment. So there's no um, no repair of these damaged proteins. So there's no refolding or no degradation. So they just stay there with the alpha crystalline as soluble complexes. But eventually, if Rams keeps doing this, this throughout his lifetime and not protecting his eyes from UV, then eventually in late age, you know, cataract can be developed when we run out. And this is for everybody, you know, the, if we run out of the alpha crystalline protein. So, when I heard this talk, because this talk um, is something, some work that Jonathan King at MIT, the Department of Biology, he, he's now retired, but he spent all his life working with this gamma crystalline. So when I first heard about these gamma crystalline proteins in the lens, I was fascinated and I asked him, what about metal ions? Because as you may have noticed, I'm a metal ion freak. So I asked him, what about metal ions? Are there metal ions in the lens? and what are they doing there, and could they be contributing to aggregation? And we found in all literature that uh, cataract lenses could have uh, up to 10 more times copper or two times more zinc than a normal healthy lens. Um, and also that there's a lot of epidemiological studies showing that occupational metal exposure can lead to early onset of cataract disease. So, um, in collaboration with Jonathan, and in fact, I ended up doing a sabbatical in his group just before he retired, um, uh, we explored this possibility. So we took gamma decrystalline that's really stable in the test tube, and we added all kinds of metal ions. And we found that copper and zinc can induce the non-amyloid aggregation of gamma decrystalline. 
Following by turbidity assays, you can see that this depends, of course, on how much metal ion, you know, the metal ion to, to protein ratio you add. But definitely the effect of uh, copper is much larger than zinc, much more drastic. And so, and you can see it here in the transmission electron microscopy, the copper-induced aggregates of the same amount of metal ion are much larger than zinc. So I'll tell you a little bit of what we have learned in the mechanism of copper-induced aggregation of these gamma crystallines. We expanded these to other gammas like gamma S and C. They are very similar. They have a very stable Greek fold uh, with this beta sheet structure, and they all are vulnerable to copper-induced aggregation. Um, if we take these proteins and look at circular dichroism and look at the folding, we titrate them with the metal ion, and we see a decrease in the 218 nanometer signal that's typical of the beta sheet structure. So this means copper is causing partial unfolding of this uh, loss of beta sheet folding in these proteins. Um, I told you these proteins are among the most stable ones in our body, so you can heat them up to 70, 75 centigrades and they're fine. Please don't try to do this with your lenses. But um, the TMs are around 70, 80 centigrades. But in the presence of copper ions, these TMs go down. So co copper is really causing a loss of the thermal stability of the protein. Um, we corroborated this by DSC. I won't go into much detail just to tell you that we can estimate the loss of kinetic stability, so the loss of the lifetime of the protein, and, and we can see that copper really reduces the kinetic stability of these proteins. And um, that we can know by using the different constructs, I won't go into the details, but we know that the N-terminal domain is the first one to unfold uh, when in the presence of copper. So it's, a, it's the first one to unfold, and when we have enough copper, it just behaves like the C-terminal domain. And of course, not surprisingly, the alpha crystalline, the chaperon, can recognize these partially folded intermediates that are formed in the presence of copper, and it can prevent copper-induced aggregation. So of course, we're in a spectroscopy lab, so we wanted to see how copper binds to the crystallines. I won't go into the details because I uh, see that I'm running out of time. But we, we found this very interesting thing. When we add copper two by EPR, we don't see enough copper two, all the copper two we add. And we now know that it's getting reduced to copper one. Uh, we also saw a free radical in the gamma D crystalline. So now we know, okay, we, we demonstrated by X-ray absorption spectroscopy that copper is getting reduced. But also we look at the EPR radical and we identify this radical um, as a tyrosine-based radical in the C-terminal domain. So basically, we have this really stable protein. You add copper 2 to it, and under aerobic conditions in the presence of oxygen, it's getting reduced to copper 1 and forming this protein-based free radical. And that somehow fits into the mechanism of aggregation. We still don't know how. I didn't show you the data, but we know that there's also formation of disulfide-rich species and metal-rich species. I showed you there's some folding and this interesting, very interesting redox chemistry, and all this must be contributing to protein aggregation. And hopefully I convince you that um, metal ions may be playing a role in, um, in this uh, aggregation of the crystallines that are relevant for cataract formation. And I just wanna take one more minute to compare this story I just told you about with that of IAPP or amylene that I know Rams is interested in studies this peptide. Um, many, many years back, we looked at copper binding to this peptide and we found that copper binds in a way that really makes it harder for the peptide to arrange into a beta sheet structure and form the beta sheet. And so the result is in a THD essay is that it looks like it's delaying the amyloid aggregation. And it's really, we think it's because it's, promoting the formation of this metal-induced uh, conformation that is not compatible with the formation of the beta sheet structure. And so at the end of the day, it's really metal ion coordination versus the strength of a beta sheet structure. And here we have the opposite, right? We have a very stable protein rich in beta sheet, and then copper is binding somewhere or at different sites, and it's ripping apart these beta sheet structures. So I think it's interesting. I think it's a uh, 
really the intersection of an avenue between looking, thinking about coordination chemistry and metal ions and um, you know, protein folding and aggregation and the strength that provides to a whole protein structure the formation of a beta sheet. And I think it would be really interesting to study these you know, from many different perspectives. Um, and with this, I will end. I try to give uh, credit to the people uh, doing the work I, sh I showed today. This is our, our group today. Uh, I have four PhD students and three postdocs at the moment, and I'm very happy with, with the lab we have. Um, and uh, of course, we're very lucky to have many collaborators. I'm not even listing them all here, just listing the ones for the stories I told you today. And uh, thank you, Rams, again for the invitation. And um, and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Great talk. Thank you so much uh, for coming. Um, there are already uh, two questions from uh, Rams, um, and uh, they are in the chat area. Uh, and I'm going to read it for you. Um, OK, thanks. Great talk. Uh, thanks, Liliana. How do copper bound and free peptides, A beta or prion, differ in their membrane binding affinities and membrane associated aggregation? I'm going to go question by question. So that's the first one. Yeah, so, so that's a really nice question. I, I think uh, Jin Hui here <laughs> is probably <laughs> um, more, more adequate to answer. I, I, I would say, I mean, the short answer will say, we know very little. Um, I I know, for example, for, through our collaboration with Claudio Fernandez in Argentina, he he's done a lot of work on synuclein. I remember copper binding to alpha synuclein helps stabilize the alpha helical structure that will be amenable for binding, you know, membranes and the vesicles. Um, I think there's more to study in that front. With A beta and prion. Ourselves, we haven't done any work on that, but it's definitely a very interesting question because the, it will differ, I'm sure, uh, depending on what is the impact of the metal ion on the conformation of the peptide, but also how exposed these hydrophobic residues are, which are important for membrane interaction. So I, I think it's it's a it's a field that's still you know a lot of a lot of questions. Uh, to, yeah, thank pose. you. Yes. Um, uh, I'll go ahead with the second question. Are there any in vivo or tissue from tissues evidence uh, for the existence of uh, a beta prion tertiary uh, complex? Yeah, no, not yet. We are we are working on it. We are working to build in a system where we can uh, probe these uh, copper protein interactions in us in in us. In cellular, in a cellular culture, so hopefully soon. Yes. Um, and then the third question is: Copper on um, IAPP. Uh, did you observe the effect of copper to be varying uh, with the concentration? Of uh, copper? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Sorry, I don't have the slide here, but but we we found uh, substoichiometric amounts like 0.5, even one equivalent of copper will um, cause the fibers to be shorter and, and uh, messier, I will say. Uh, eventually, when you reach two equivalents of copper, you see uh, completely um, disordered aggregates, I will say, like they're not amyloid, but they're not also the, like these nice ones I showed you from the crystallines. Um, so there's definitely an effect. Eventually, you don't see any THD um, um, uh, fluorescence or no formation of the amyloid fibril. And we really think it is because, since I have the presentation here, let me, oh, ah, okay. Well, I, um, I wanted to show you, <laughs> I don't know what happened to my computer. Uh, yes, so so eventually, I mean, we think what is going on is, is that the copper, you see copper binds to the only histidine in the, in the, in the peptide, which as you know, is in the middle. And that histidine in the beta sheet structure is here, is inside the beta sheet. So really copper is imposing a conformation and you know, imposing a way of binding that is incompatible with the beta sheet structure. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, so I'm going with the questions from uh, Q&A. Uh, the first one is uh, from Amaru Gezan, and it is, what is the source of metal ions for the human eyes? Does a human lens have blood circulation? Yeah, so no, the human lens does not have direct uh, blood circulation because it has to be transparent. So it's exchange with blood goes through the humus vitreous. And really the exchange goes through, I'll, I'll try to go back. Let's see if this time works. Um, um, it, it goes through the epithelial cells that are in the outer part of the lens. So, um, so that's the exchange. So I am sure they're here. So, so as you can see these epithelial layers, so these are there. These are still have all their organelles and things in place, but it's a very thin layer. So that will be the the interface between the lens and the humus vitreous, and then the humus vitreous in turn has an exchange with the blood vessels. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the next one, and this will be the last question uh, before we transition to the other. Yes. Speaker is from Ashutosh. Uh, great talk. Biting of uh, copper lowers uh, the melting temperature of the better crystalline uh, protein. Has your group or anyone else looked at crystal structures of proteins with bound copper that may explain lowering the uh, melting temperature? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so no, we haven't. We have talked about it with some crystallographers uh, to, to see how we will do this experiment. The problem is um, copper binds and it causes this unfolding. And that, that of course, is probably at the source of lowering the, the TM. But the crystallizing a species like that will be really hard. So it will be like trying to crystallize this, this guy here with a metal ion bound in the middle. Um, so we thought the best strategy would be to grow a crystal of these proteins and then soak the crystals in metal ions and see what they get. But then again, that's not gonna be necessarily informative of what happens, you know, the dynamics that happens when copper binds and starts to cause this kind of partial unfolding. So. It's an interesting question, but I think it's hard to get to, but we, we will try to do the crystallography eventually. <laughs> yes. Yeah, thank you very much. I really enjoyed thank your you. talk. And uh, now you. we can go to our uh, second uh, speaker. Thank you very much, Liana, for a great talk. I will remember the sunglasses, definitely. Thanks yes, for... yes. Everybody after my talk, then they come back and said, you know, I always wear sunglasses now. <laughs> So, Thanks, Magda. So our next speaker is <clears throat> next speaker is Dr. Cristiano Diaz from uh, Physics Department at the New Jersey Institute for Technology. Cristiano completed his PhD degree in Physics from McGill University, Canada, and then postdoctoral research at the University of Toronto in Biochemistry, Western University in Applied Mathematics, and Free University of Berlin in Physics. Following that, he joined the uh, New Jersey Institute of Technology and uh, where his lab in collaboration with the experimentalists performs computational and theoretical studies to better understand the protein self-assembly processes related to AMLI diseases. So Cristiano, I'm delighted to welcome you and thanks very much for joining us today. Please get started. Yes, thank you very much Rams for the invitation to speak here. And just to be sure, can you see my slide properly uh, Rams? Uh, yes, can you, this is, you need to go back to the uh, presenters mode. Oh, I see, let's, uh, so I'm here. I don't know if, if you, you can. If you go to the display settings at the top. Okay. The top okay. banner, it should. So I think I have to come here, PowerPoints. Oops. We went, let me share the, the whole screen. The, does it work or? No, uh, Sam, no, still not. now again, the display settings. Uh, uh, the, see oh. the, dis go back to sure, share yeah. the screen, see the display yeah. settings there. Yeah, swap presenter view and slideshow. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, great. there you go. 
now you can see, I guess. Uh, yep. Yep. <clears throat> beautiful. Um, yeah, so as, as I mentioned, thank you very much, Rams, for the invitation to speak here. And one of the things I would like to do today is talk to you about some of the work we've been doing on the interaction of amyloid proteins and lipid membranes and how this interaction leads to membrane damage. And I would like to start with a very simple slide here where just mentioned that uh, amyloid proteins are disordered proteins that, that have a high tendency to aggregate. So even at low concentration, like uh, micromolar, those proteins, they tend to form some aggregates, some uh, disordered aggregates. And these aggregates, they undergo a conformational change and, they, and peptides in these aggregates, they tend to form at least one beta sheet. And the uh, hydrophobic residues in these beta sheets, they just come together. So they, there is a stacking of the beta sheets and this leads to the cross beta structure or the cross beta pattern that is characteristic of amyloid peptides. And this cross beta structures, they can extend for uh, several micrometers in, in length. So it's, they, they are very stable. And some of the knowledge that we gain from uh, so our knowledge of the mechanisms leading to the formation of fibril came mostly from looking at uh, kinetic experiments of the fibril load. So how the fibril load increases as a function of temperature, sorry, how the fibril load increases as a function of time. And, uh, and, and this quantity, and, 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 this, and this can be of course modeled using rate equations and only the models that have the right rate equations, they can, uh, quantitatively reproduce this, the, the fibro load as a function of time. And one of the, the things that came out of it is that uh, we figured out that most of the oligomers that are formed uh, in the system, they are catalyzed actually on the surface of amyloid fibrils. Um, so those are very interesting uh, developments that, uh, that happened in, the, in recent years, in the last five, 10 years. And what I would like to do today is not really talk about amyloid peptides, but amyloid-like peptides. So those are short peptides that behave like amyloid peptides. So they aggregate forming beta sheets. One side of the beta sheet tends to be polar. The other side is non-polar. And so two beta sheets, when they come close together, they end, they end up forming the cross beta structure that is characteristic of the amyloid fibrils. Uh, those cross beta structures, they also extend for several micrometers, as you can see here in the figure. And uh, recently, um, and recently, there are some cryo uh, cryoEM images have been done of this uh, fibrils, and we can see that the fibrils they also pack together, forming this supramolecular structure. So this nanotubes here. Um, this is just one example of peptides. You can, of course. Uh, change the position of the peptides, change the amino acid sequence. And one of the reasons or the motivation for studying these peptides is that they can be used as new materials for, of course, bi for biomedical applications, as for example, for drug delivery systems. And this is somehow, uh, we, we can imagine mimicking nature where you have those fibrils encapsulating drugs like the, sh the eggshell of silk moth and then be delivered to different organs or different places in, a, in the human body. So if you can tune the properties of the fibril, we can tune where, where the drugs are going to be released. Um, there, uh, those fibrils are also envisioned as a, as a, as a wound healing uh, material. So if you have a wound, you, instead of using a bandage, you will use those fibrils on top of it. And you can, of course, add function to those fibrils like antimicrobial prop properties. So making those materials uh, highly desirable. Um, I also like to think of this uh, short peptides, this amyloid-like peptides as, as simple models to understand diseases like the formation of plaques in the brain of Alzheimer's patients or how this amyloids uh, cause damage uh, in diseases. So how they penetrate the cell membrane uh, causing pores or other types of damages. Uh, those amyloid-like peptides, they can also be used for, uh, to understand functional peptides, like for, like for example, the adhesion of uh, fungi, which is, also, which is mediated by amyloid peptides, accounting for the formation of biofilms. Um, all right. <clears throat> so one of the things I would like to mention is that, uh, so my lab, we do uh, computational and theoretical work. 
And most of the studies I'm going to show you today comes from all atom simulations, so we, where we perform very long all atom simulations. I believe that I don't need to go through the through the details of the method. I think it's quite known. Probably the only thing I would like to mention is that uh, so we've been using here the the work I'm going to show here is uh, the simulations were performed with the amber 99 SBILDN force field or the CHARM 36M force field. So some of the simulations were done with one, other simulations with the other. And this was a way for us to also understand the uh, effects of this of, of the force field on the, on the results we were getting. And... All right, so, so simulations have become very powerful nowadays. Oops, I don't, have become very powerful. And uh, we can nowadays start a simulation to so a box with peptides randomly located in the simulation box and look at how this uh, peptides evolve, how they start aggregating, and then how they start forming fibrils. And of course, because we know the position of each one of the atoms, we can uh, quantify the aggregation process by counting the number of bonds between the peptides. And this can be done for different amino acid sequence. For example, for the sequence I've showed you before, where we have nonpolar residue F, K is positively charged and E is negatively charged. So this sequence here is neutral and it has a nonpolar residue alternating with a positively charged residue versus a negatively charged one. And uh, this sequence here was shown experimentally to form fibrils. Uh, to promptly form fibrils even at low concentration, 0.2 millimolar. And you can see the fibrils forming experimentally here. And our simulation somehow reproduced this result. Um, this other sequence here, <clears throat> so, it, yeah, so, so something interesting is that we have here now the same amino acids, but just shuffled around. So now all the phenylalanine residues are in the middle. So all the nonpolar residues are in the middle. And this sequence here also formed fibrils experimentally, but at a higher concentration. And somehow our simulation, so simulations, they can nowadays capture this type of behavior. So you can see here that uh, they form less fibril than the first sequence, but still they form fibril. So you can see the better sheet here in the, in the, in the fibril structure after three microseconds. And the last sequence here, again, the same amino acids, just in a different position along the sequence. And this one here, even at high concentration, does not form fibril experimentally. We observe roughly the same behavior uh, in our simulations. And I find that this is very important because if you look at bioinformatic tools like Tango or AgregScan, they cannot predict the same sequence of aggregations for this three, three peptide sequences here. For example, Tango predicts that the last one is the one that aggregates faster and the first one it's the one that aggregates slower uh, so this is just to say that this all atom simulations are now becoming very powerful the fact that we can run very long simulations using large boxes are making those simulations predictive and so before doing an experiment that might take a long time to do to to be performed one can now run some of those simulations in a computer. The limitation is, of course, the, the, the sequence size. It has to be short sequences. Um, it's still very challenging to fold, uh, for example, the full amyloid better 1 to 42. Um, I believe that this has not been done yet, so it's something that is still very challenging. And I, sorry, I should also mention that, <clears throat> of course, there is now the alpha fold, alpha fold that can predict the structure of uh, proteins or aggregates with a very high precision. Alpha fold from Google has, has, however, one limitation is that it cannot, at least for now, it cannot work for short sequences. It can only work for, with sequences that are larger than 60 residues, 16 residues. So that's why all atom simulations are still very relevant. Uh, but anyhow, what I would like to do today is talk to you about uh, the interaction of peptides with lipid membranes. And in order to understand this interaction, we have used the, the, the setup that I'm showing you here, where we have a lipid bilayer and a peptide in the solution with water molecules, of course, uh, around the, the system. The peptide sequence that I use is the one where we have nonpolar uh, phenylalanine alternating with positive and negative amino acids. And one of the things we did is that we measured the distance between the peptide 
and the lipid membrane. And in, in the simulation, it looks a lot like this here. So the peptide is sometimes close to the membrane, sometimes far away from the membrane, and it keeps oscillating. And some of our simulations gave us slightly different results where the peptide initially oscillates, so binds and unbinds from the protein, but then at the end, it becomes absorbed onto the membrane. And this absorption is very stable, so it lasts until the end of the simulation with the phenylalanine residues buried inside the lipid membrane. So that's what we have here in this, in this figure. And for now, <clears throat> I will talk about the absorption a little later, but for now, I just want to talk about this induction time, so the time of where the peptide is binding and unbinding reversibly from the membrane. And one of the things we can do is, of course, a histogram of the distance. So a histogram of the distance and then define the distance where the peptide is bound versus the distance where the peptide is unbound from the membrane. And the interesting thing is that we can compute then the fraction of the simulation in which the peptide is found bound to the membrane. So we can compute the how much time the peptide spends here bound to the membrane. And this can be done, for example, for different conditions. For example, for simulations where we have calcium added to the solution, in simulations where we have lipids, which are not only sweeter ionic like POPC, but are also negative. So where we add negative lipids to the membrane, 10% of POPG, which is negative, or 30% of POPG. So we can start in this way, uh, the effect of ions in the solution or the effect of uh, charged lipids uh, or, or the effect of lipid composition. Um, one thing that we, so one of the things that we found is that adding a negative lipids to the membrane increases the binding ratio of the system. So the peptide binds more to the membrane if, the lip, if we have negative lipids in the system. And the other thing, uh, is that if we add calcium to the system, this can almost inhibit the, the binding of the peptide to the membrane. So if we add positive calcium to the membrane, it stops the, the binding of the peptide to the membrane. To understand this process, to understand what is going on in the system, one of the things we did is that uh, for each distance of the peptide to the membrane, we computed which one is the residue that is closer to the membrane. And so for example, so for example, at a distance of two, uh, two nanometers, <clears throat> we can see here that lysine is 25% uh, of the time closer to the membrane, while phenylalanine is roughly 40% time closer to the membrane. And so this looks like a random process and it's simply because we have more phenylalanine than lysine, that's why we observe this difference. But as we start approaching the membrane, so. Uh, as we start approaching the membrane, the lysine residues are the ones that start becoming uh, closer to the membrane. So they start being attracted to the membrane. And this can be seen very clearly uh, in this picture here, where we have the lysine residue, which is actually attracted to the phosphate atom of, uh, of, of the lipids, of phospholipids. So the, negative, the phospholipids are negatively charged, and the positive charge of the, the lysine is attracted to it. Uh, when we add calcium to the system, we observe the opposite behavior. So lysine, instead of being attracted, so becoming more pronounced close to the lipid membrane, it is now repelled from the lipid membrane. So it's now uh, less pronounced close to the lipid membrane. And this phenomena happened because calcium <clears throat> calcium also wants to bind to the, to the phosphate atoms here. So so they, they bind to the lipid bilayer, making the lipid bilayer slightly positive, and now it starts repelling the lysine, uh, the lysine residues. Uh, all right. So, the, <clears throat> so one question that usually comes out is, uh, why doesn't the, the, the positive moiety of the lipids, the phospholipids, the sweeter ionic lipids, the, the positive part here, why doesn't it attract the negative uh, glutamic acid? And what we saw is that so the, the, this positive moiety of the lipid is, more, is exposed to the solvent, so it's more exposed to the solvent, and the solvent ends up, uh, uh, <clears throat> the, the solvents or water molecules, it can, it can change its dipole moment in order to screen these positive charges. So the direction of the dipole moment uh, 
screens those positive charges. So that's why the, the negative glutamic acid is not attracted to the lip, lipid membrane, but the positive lysine residues, they are the ones that are attracted to the membrane. All right. All right, so, so we, 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 get, we got this insight that lysine is attracted to the lipid membrane. So the question that came up now is, uh, how can we use this insight in order to design new peptides that can bind to the lipid membranes? One of the things we can do is, of course, add negative residues or positive residues to the, to the peptide. So this is the, the same peptide as we had before. We are now adding four negative residue, two negative residues, two positive residues here, and four positive residues. And if we look at the binding ratio, we do indeed see an increase in the binding ratio whenever we have uh, positive residues at the end of the peptide. So this, this sounds very good. But it's a little obvious that's what we should expect, of course. So we then try to look at what happens if we start scrambling the position of the amino acids in the reference peptide. So we have this neutral peptide. We just scramble the position of the amino acids in the sequence. And those are the sequence that we've tried. So we have like the two lysine residues are at the extremity. And then the lysine of the, in the C-terminal will, will bring it closer to the middle of the peptide and the other lysine in the N-terminal, we also bring it closer. So we then look at the binding ratio, and what we found is that uh, in the binding ratio tends also to increase as we put the lysine residues to the extremity. So as we put the lysine residues to the extremity, like in sequence A, uh, the, those lysine residues will have a larger solvent accessible surface area. So they are more exposed to the solvent and they bind better to the membrane or they bind with, uh, they are more attracted to the membrane. We also tried sequences of where the two lysines are close to each other and we observed the similar behavior. So whenever the lysines are at the extremity, they bind more than when the peptide is, uh, when the, the lysine residues are in the middle of the sequence. So we start getting some insights about how to design peptides, where to put the charged residues in the sequence. <clears throat> and before I move to uh, membrane damage, I will just like to mention, so I, 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 I would like to mention that we did, of course, various simulations for the same sequence, like we run five simulations. And as I mentioned to you, in some of the simulations, the peptide ended up in are binding irreversibly to the lipid membrane. So it binded to the lipid membrane and it remained there. Um, so the question is, can we get any insights from this from the absorption? So if we want to design peptides that uh, absorb onto the membrane, can we uh, what 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 do our simulations tell us about the system? So if we if we look again at so one of the things we did is just we just counted the number of trajectories that uh, in which the peptide bound in re irreversibly to the membrane. So in this case here we have three uh, trajectories out of five. So, so in sixty percent of the trajectories the peptide ended up binding irreversibly to the membrane. And so for each one of the sequences that we studied we we have this uh, this number the absorption number. And we try to make some sense out of those numbers. So one of the things we observe is that all the sequences where the, the, where the non-polar residues is in, the, is in the beginning of the sequence, so those are the gray areas here, there is a slightly higher increase in the absorption. In a, so for example, the sequence E, there is 80% of, of, of our simulations ended up being absorbed onto the membrane. So this makes us somehow infer that probably adding a non-polar residues to the extremity of the peptide makes it absorbed much more. And so we've, we've tried one simulations where we had two phenylalanine in the beginning. And as you can see here, as a matter of fact, the peptide very quickly came to the membrane and became absorbed onto the membrane. So in 100% of the simulations. And, so of course we don't have so yeah we don't have equilibrium and uh, and to be certain of this we need to do many more trajectories not only four but those are already very expensive simulations where we we are running simulations for one microseconds in large boxes with uh, a lot of water molecules and 
but roughly the takeaway of this uh, of this design part of the of the seminar here is that um, uh, is that so we have here so if we are looking at uh, how a peptide approaches the membrane so electrostatic interaction seems to play a very important role in this attraction um, and in particular placing this not this uh, charged residues to the extremity that's very important on the other hand if we want to design peptides that are absorbed then placing the nonpolar residues at the extremity this seems to be something that is uh, important if we want to design peptides and probably combining as the, these two strategies might be a, might be the best way to go for if you want to design a peptide that binds to the lipid membrane <clears throat> so i forgot to time myself but i hope i'm uh, i'm on time what i would like to do now is talk to you about membrane damage so how can simulations help us to understand mem membrane damage and we know from experiments that um, if we if uh, if we have liposomes in a solution in a buffer, if we add amyloid proteins to the solution, the, this membranes those liposomes start leaking, and that's what we are seeing here in the lower figure here. So we have the liposomes have dyes inside them. The the amyloid proteins they they bind to this dye and they produce the damage. So this damage, so the, the dyes that are being released, they can be quantified, they can, we, we can quantify this. And so we can quantify the membrane damage if we, if we add calcium to the system, that's just one example. With calcium, there is low, uh, small, little damage without calcium, much more damage. We can look at lipid composition. So how does the lipid composition affects uh, leakage? So in this case here, we are seeing how it affects the aggregation process of peptides. So it affects not only leakage, but also the aggregation. And we can also look at uh, uh, damage. So how different sequences affect damage of, uh, of, of lipid membranes. Um, they, are mainly, they are mainly two mechanisms of membrane damage by, uh, by peptides that are being discussed in the literature. One of them is sporation. So when peptides bind to the lipid membranes, the, and, and aggregate on the lipid membranes before forming pores. Uh, you can also produce uh, pores that can be a, that can be seen experimentally. So through AFM, of course, each one of the units here is not just one single amyloid. It's many amyloid proteins here, many amyloid proteins in one of those units. Uh, damage can also proceed uh, through the aggregation of those peptides in the solution. And this aggregates can bind to the lipid membrane, can bind to the lipid membrane, and as as they get out of the lipid membrane, as they are, they get out, they drag some lipids with them, so they can damage lipid membrane by removing lipids from the membrane. So this is a detergent-like damage. And so one of the questions we were asking ourselves is, can we understand this process with our simulations? So so now we know that we can deposit peptides on the lipid membrane. Can we now look at aggregation and the, the formation of pores? And so what we did is that we took the same peptide as we have bef we had before, so the ones alternating between nonpolar and charged uh, residues, and we deposit them in a POPC, POPG membrane. So, so here we have a seven, three, seven POPG for every seven POPG. POPC, we have three POPGs, so POPG is negatively charged. We use POP, so we use this negatively charged lipid bilayers because we know that's a way peptides bind more closely, binds more to those negatively charged membranes. And we ended up depositing peptides on the upper layer and the lower layer of the, the bilayer. <clears throat> and then we run our simulations. So in the, in the beginning, we had some dimers here in the beginning. But as we run the simulation, there, there is aggregation happening. So if we look at the number of hydrogen bonds between the peptides, this increases significantly uh, up to three microseconds. And uh, up to three micro, and at the end at three microseconds, we see the formation of larger beta sheets like hexamers, tetramers, trimers. Um, and something interesting that happened also is that if we look, if we compute the number of water molecules between in, inside the bilayer, what we observe is that at around 3.5 microseconds, 
uh, the number of water molecule increases drastically. So there is a huge increase in the number of water molecules in between the bilayers. And the figure at the last, at, at five microseconds shows that we end up having like, we end up having a pore in the system. So the bilayer has now formed. So this, this peptides, they ended up forming a, a pore. So we can look at this. So we can look at this very carefully. We can compute different quantities. As I mentioned before, the number of water in between the two bilayers, the number of hydrogen bonds between the different peptides. We can look, for example, at uh, the position of the different tetramers and hexamers uh, in the system. And we can see that uh, poration starts with uh, an upper, a peptide in the upper leaflet interacting with the peptide in the lower leaflet, and both of them coming close together to produce the pore that we are seeing here. And then the other peptides, they join in uh, almost immediately or a little later. As I mentioned, a good thing about this, the systems is that, um, <clears throat> is that we, we can look at, we, we have the positions of all the atoms in the system here. And one of the things that we computed was the deuterium order parameter. It basically measures uh, the orientation of the lipid tail, whether the lipid tail is perpendicular or the lipid tail is parallel to the, to the system. If the lipid tail is parallel, the deuterium order parameter is small. And if the, if the lipid tail is per, perpendicular to the, to the bilayer, then this quantity becomes large. Uh, it becomes larger, as you can see here. So poration accounts for a change in the orientation of the lipids, as we can see here in this in these figures. Before pore formation, you, we have the peptides on the lipid membranes. And we have here the lipid tails, which are almost parallel to the lipid membrane. Whenever the pore has formed, now the peptides are perpendicular to the lipid membrane. And this is, uh, and, and the reason why this happens is because the lipid tails are nonpolar and they, and they want to interact with the phenylalanine residues that I'm representing by balls here. So we have this, uh, so forming a pore improves the, uh, the orientation of the lipid tails, which is something good. We also observed that uh, during pore, one of the first things that happened during pore formation is the interaction of phenylalanine at the bottom and the top of the, of the, pe of the peptide. So they start interacting with each other and this drives the formation of the pore. I should mention that we also looked at poration from just one leaflet. So if we have peptides on just one leaflet of the, of the membrane. And here again, poration happened when we, when the better sheets, different better sheets. So here we had in the beginning, uh, three better sheets, two of them end, ended up coming close together and forming a, a heptamer. That's, that's right, seven, so a heptamer. And then poration started when this blue, this blue uh, peptides, this blue uh, sheet started interacting with this red sheet here. So they started interacting through the phenylalanine side chains. And this process led, led uh, induced water molecules to come deeper and deeper inside the membrane, as you can see here. I'm sorry, I should have put in the time scale of these images. And one of the things that we observed also is the, is the exposure of nonpolar groups in the system, not only the peptides, but also nonpolar groups of the lipid tails, it decreased significantly during poration. So that's what we are observing here in this in the system. And I'll talk a little more about the mechanisms in a, in a few seconds. I just want to mention that we, uh, so in, in some of the simulations that we performed, we were hoping to see a, the pore, so we were extending the simulations, uh, hoping to see pore at, at some point, but some of our simulations never produced pore. So actually in some of the simulations, the different better sheets, they started interacting with each other. And as they interacted, uh, the phenylalanine side chains, they, they, they wanted to get closer and closer together. So they, want, they were packing against each other. And this led the better sheets to somehow uh, become extended and start getting out of the membrane. So if we look at the Z positions of those beta sheets, we see that they stick out of the membrane. So the, the orange one here, the, those are the phosphate atoms. In these three regions here, we see the beta sheets sticking out. 
And in the process of sticking out, they also grab some lipids with them and, they, and the lipids also stick out of the membrane. So we believe that this might be a precursor for the formation of detergent-like damages. Uh, I should mention that we never observed any of those structures getting out of the lipid membrane, but there is just this, this, chain, this, uh, this effect here. <clears throat> All right, so what is the takeaway of those simulations? So we, uh, so we run those simulations, we, obs we observed poor formation. What did we learn? Uh, so one of the things that we learned is that uh, we, we only observed uh, damages whenever there was interactions between beta sheets. So just having one better sheet did not lead to damage in our simulations. It doesn't mean that a, a single better sheet cannot produce damage, but we have not seen this in our simulations. For example, for the form uh, and 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 the interaction between these better sheets is driven by uh, non-polar side chains. So, for example, poration is driven by uh, the side chains interacting, the side chains of neighboring better sheets interacting with each other. Same. Same thing here for the detergent-like damage. Uh, in, the, in the case of detergent-like damage, it always happens whenever the edge of the better sheets, so we see here the better sheets, the edge of the better sheets came close together, and this led them to, uh, to stick out of the membrane. In the case of pore, it usually involved the, the side of the better sheet that I'm calling here tip. Um, probably induced by fibrils, but the, the side of the better sheet where you have the hydrogen bonds here, whenever this side interacted with the edge of another better sheet, that's when pores start forming in the system. And so the, this give, so this gives us, so the, um, I mean, one might imagine whether we can play with the amino acid sequence now to favor one type of damage versus the other type, perhaps, uh, for some sequences where edges are favored over this type of interaction here between the tip and the edge, then we will have more detergent-like damages. So this is something that needs to be seen, but it might be possible to design, a, to, to design peptides that will, will damage the, the membrane by one mechanism and not the other. At least that's something that I, uh, I envision. Um, Perfect. And I, I really don't know how I'm doing with time, but uh, I just would like to thank, of course, the people who have done the work. So the PhD students, uh, Shara Ray, who is looking at the aggregation of those peptides, and Yang Xin, who just graduated now in September, and also the undergraduate students and our fantastic collaborator, Bradley Nielsen, who is, uh, has been performing a lot of experiments to support some of the things we've been uh, observing in our simulations. And having said this, thank you very much for your, for your attention. Thank you very much, Cristiano, for a great talk. Really nice stuff. I liked it very much. I have a couple of questions before we, we can wait for our questions to be posted in the Q&A folder. Let me ask you my questions uh, meanwhile. Sure. Um, you, you carefully chosen phenylalanine as the hydrophobic residue as opposed to valine or losing or long acyl chain containing amino acids. Is there any reason for that? Do you wanted the Fifi uh, piper interaction to play a role in this peptide action? That's a very good question, Ramza. <clears throat> you are talking about the damage or for the aggregation of yeah, both? For both of them. Um, so for the aggregation, the main motivation was the experiment. So our our collaborator, he works with those. He has been working with those peptides and doing great uh, a great job uh, mm -hmm. looking at the aggregation and how changing the amino acid sequence affects aggregation. So we started with phenylalanine for the, for this reason. So this was our motivation, and I should mention that experimentally, uh, they are not even able to to. Uh, to look at this uh, the aggregation process because those peptides they aggregate so fast mm. that uh, it, it's uh, difficult to to uh, to observe that's this was one of the reasons why we think we were also successful in producing the aggregation here because it our simulations as you see is <clears throat> they are very short like microsecond simulations it's uh, and 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 this brings me to uh, regarding the membrane uh, this brings us to a uh, Something that I forgot to mention is that uh, 
So if the interaction between uh, th this uh, non-polar residues is something very important for the, for the membrane damage, it needs to be studied more carefully uh, in the presence of lipid membranes. So we don't know whether uh, valin will prefer to, to stick together as opposed to sticking to the, to the lipid tails, you know. And that's something that I think is very important and definitely needs to be studied more carefully. Uh, so in your anionic containing lipid membrane, like 7 to 3 PCPG, when the peptide approaches membrane, do you see lipid segregating to form PG-rich domains and things like that? And we, we, we haven't looked into this, uh, Ramsey. It, it's, yeah, we, we haven't lo looked into this. It's possible that this happens. And that's something that is quite interesting. Yeah, so, of course, this opens a question now for looking at damage with different lipid compositions and uh, looking more carefully at the structure of the of the lipids. Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Yeah. There's a question from Anna Ulrich uh, in the Q&A box. Interesting observations. Were the pores stable or did they pop out of the membrane again? The pores, no. So in, in our simulations, they remain in the membrane until the end. Uh, yes, so there is no, they do, do not pop up. Um, it might just be a limitation of our simulation. So we are dealing with microsecond uh, simulations. Uh, probably one thing I didn't mention is that we also look at fibrils. Mm -hmm. So if you put fibrils in the solution, the fibrils do not produce uh, uh, any damage or significant changes in the structure of the lipid membranes. Uh, and we think that, and the reason is because the phenylalanines are buried inside the fibril, you know, buried inside the dry core. So there is no room for damage, uh, at least in the lamp scales that we observed. Uh, Interesting. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you another question. So in your... Initially, you mentioned about the fiber formation through this amphipathic beta sheet uh, stacking up. Um, I would assume that the electrostatic interaction is playing a role in these fibers. Does it mean that these fibers are going to be unstable if you have a salty condition? Um, <clears throat> that, that's, a, that's a very good. Uh, so one, one thing I can tell you is that like <clears throat> our expert, our colleagues, so he, he uh, he studied peptides with only positively charged residues, so only plus K, plus K. And in that case, um, of course, ions, they, they favored aggregation. So by adding ions to the system, we had more aggregation happening. So that this was something that was observed. Uh, for this peptides in particular, if we add ions, does it change the aggregation? We've done it in, a, in the simulations. And in the simulations, we did not observe a signif uh, any significant effect. Yeah. So it's it's not obvious whether ions will uh, will affect this the systems. Yeah. So we added ions and the aggregation was there in the same manner. Yeah. Very interesting. Any questions from the panel or uh, participants? Please raise your hand or post your comment. You can also join the panel if you like. Uh, let me ask another question. So you 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 see this pore formation, um, uh, mainly because of the bridging of our kind of fusing the lipid bilayers, right? Do you think these peptides can act like a fusogenic peptides, like viral peptides, uh, fusing the membrane? Um, fusing the membrane, it, it, it could be possible, uh, Rams, but I, but I have to think a little more about this. Yeah, it's, yeah. Okay. But then that's a good thing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rams. Danilo? Okay, my congrats for to both speakers for the excellent talks. I have a, just a, a question for Liliana. I don't know if whether she is still around. Um, my question is: Okay, the notion that copper ions may bridge amyloid beta peptide with prion particles is quite attractive because they it's it may, makes me think that copper ions may somehow initiate cross-seeding between amyloid peptide and prion proteins. So I don't know, is there any known comorbidity linking Alzheimer's disease with prion disease that can somehow related to these molecular mechanisms? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Thank you. Um, yes, so we are thinking right now about the functional part. We are studying, you know, the, the prion protein, the copper, the A-beta in the context of these 
neuroprotective mechanism that I talked about. But you are right that it could have major implications in terms of the aggregation of the two proteins. And this will remain to be explored. We haven't really gone there ourselves. Uh, Thank you. Yes, but thanks for the question. It's it's really we 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 kind of moved back to the physiological relevance of these copper protein interactions in the synapse as we were starting to think about peptides with uh, bifunctional peptides with um, you know with therapeutic potential in Alzheimer's disease. But then we thought you know a lot of these efforts have gone have not gone farther than clinical trials, second phase, and so on. And we thought maybe this is because we are chelating away the metal ion from very important physiological functions. And this is why we moved there. But you're right that we should move back to aggregation and think about the co-aggregation of these two proteins. And many other ones, because there's other involved in neurodegenerative diseases that are, you know, at the end is these aggregates are a bit of a mix of several proteins in some cases, in some diseases, yes. Uh, Anna Ulrich, um, please go ahead and ask a question. Yes, thank you to both of the speakers. Um, to Cristiano now, I have a question regarding the phenylalanines that cover one phase of your beta sheets. And phenylalanines are known to preferentially sit in the amphiphilic interface of lipid bilayers somewhere between head groups and A cell chains. What do you think would happen if instead of phenylalanines, you were to use leucines or some aliphatic hydrophobic side chains? Have you done such simulations or what would you predict? Can't hear you? You're muted, uh, Cristiano. Yeah, well, saying that's a beautiful question, Anna. Uh, we, we looked at valine, so we we, uh, perf we had some beta sheets uh, made from valine. One of the things we observe is that valine does indeed bind to the... So, so the simulations were like two valines in the... So, so we put one valine, so one beta sheet, it bound to the lipid membrane. We took another beta sheet and we simulated both of them, one in the solution, one on the, on the, on the surface. And we end up seeing that the one that was in the solution binding to the one that was on the membrane sticking out a little bit, getting some pit, some lipids also sticking out, you know. So we, we think that this is not uh, <clears throat> restricted to phenylalanine also. If it works for valine, it might work for leucine or some other aliphatic uh, side chains. Yeah, so the, so that, that's yeah. a very nice question. Yeah. My guess would have mm -hmm. been that something long and aliphatic would prefer to enter the bilayer more deeply rather than phenylalanine, which may act like a That's floating right. device. Mm -hmm. But you have seen the opposite. You see that it pulls lipids out. Yeah. But Anna, we'll check this more carefully. That's a, that's a wonderful question. Um, <clears throat> perhaps if we put uh, two better sheets on the membrane, you know, perhaps it might be even stronger. Um, I was not aware that phenylalanine liked to stick at, at at the, in the, on the upper side of the membrane. So th that's a good thing that we can check in the simulations. Yeah. That's very nice. Uh, yeah. Th thank you very much. Uh, well, are you them? You can unmute, ask a question. You have to unmute. Yeah, yes. go ahead. Yeah. Um, my question is to Liliana. So in some countries, like, you know, the level of arsenic in the drinking water is high. So they call it an arsenic poisoning, OK? So have you looked at the interaction between the arsenic and the crystalline in the lens? Yeah, we, we have not looked into arsenic, but you are right. Uh, we should, in Mexico, we definitely have this problem also of ars arsenic contamination. We have not looked at this, uh, at this uh, element, yeah. Yeah, then my- Good, oh. good idea. <laughs> yeah. My next question is like, you know, in, uh, patients with Wilson disease, they have increased level of copper in the liver and brain, okay? So in that case, okay, I mean, so it's a kind of, whether that kind of patients are kind of more prone for Alzheimer's and that kind of diseases or what happened to the crystalline in the lens, human's lens, like, you know? Yeah, so we Wilson's disease patients, uh, if 
if I'm if I'm correct, I think they develop cataract also well not cataract yeah cataract but also develop this uh, like ring around the oh. iris, and uh, it's that you know it's due to the copper. Um, we we have. Yeah, since we started this crystalline thing, we we have been interested also in thinking about this. You know what happens in that in that disease where where there's a copper overload, and definitely um, uh, you know will have an impact also in the proteins in the islands. Um, we haven't worked with with any model of Wilson's disease, but. Uh, Maybe we should. The problem with models for the human lens is that these fiber cells cannot be cultured. So, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. basically, yeah, because they are devoid of all these organelles. So it's hard to establish a model to, to study this. Uh, you know, so, test. in your EPR studies, okay, did you record all the spectra to room temperature or you recorded the, I mean, uh, the EPR spectra, EPR studies? Uh, EPR. So, for the copper, yeah. We did um, we did liquid nitrogen. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, we use a liquid nitrogen flow, so it's 140, 150 Kelvin. Um, for the tyrosine radical, I showed we moved to to we, we did both actually. We did liquid nitrogen and we also moved to room temperature. Amazingly, the free radical is stable enough that you can collect the the, the API data at room temperature. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. thank you. All right. I don't see any other questions. So, so time to thank the speakers, Cristiano and Liliana for great talks. And thank you all for joining us today. So we'll see you on Monday next week. Bye-bye. Thank you thank for you. the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Jingri. Bye. Bye, Anna. <laughs> nice seeing you.